Hi everybody, welcome to FNS Wrestling Podcast. I am your host, running another solo mission tonight, came back down in the basement here on a Sunday evening to talk about a pay-per-view I finished watching a couple hours ago, and that would be Impact Wrestling's Hard to Kill from January 8th, 2022. So I thought I would, I don't know, had a bit of free time in the evening, thought I'd come down here, test out yet another microphone. I have a bit of a problem with collecting microphones right now. And thought I would do a solo mission to talk about this pay-per-view that, not to ruin anything, but a kind of, uh, very much a mixed bag, a pay-per-view of two halves for me, really. Um, really enjoyed one half, not so much the second half. So hope you're all doing well. Hope you had a chance to check out FNS Wrestling Podcast episode 77 of our main show that we put out yesterday. That's where Jack and I discuss the week of wrestling. I think this week we talked about AEW Dynamite like we always do, NXT 2.0, AEW Rampage as well. And then there's always a section where I do some trivia quiz Jack on what he knows this week. It was about uh, NXT graduates to the main roster, which he did very well on. And then he always gives us an update from the world of wrestling action figures at the end of the podcast. So if you haven't had a chance to check that out, please feel free. We'd really appreciate it. We'd also appreciate any feedback from any listeners. If you happen to be checking us out, it's fnswrestling at gmail.com. If you'd like to email, fns underscore wrestling underscore podcast is our address on Instagram, if you'd like, or if you're one of the few that listens on YouTube, you can also leave a comment there. I do promise I will get back to anybody that leaves any sort of uh, comment on any of the platforms. I will get a reply to you. With that being said, I think we should probably move right into talking about this pay-per-view that was held yesterday and that I finished watching today, and that is Impact Wrestling's Hard to Kill. So we'll see how this review goes. I am doing it a little different than I, on some of my other solo, well, all of my other solo missions, I guess, technically, because I didn't plan on really reviewing this, but, so I didn't really take detailed notes or anything. I'm kind of just going off of my memory which may be a poor decision i guess we'll find that out shortly so it won't be any sort of move for move summaries it'll just be kind of who won maybe the finish and then my thoughts on on the match itself um and yeah so i just i think i watched it in two sittings basically the first half um it was about a three hour pay-per-view and then came back and watched the second half i did watch the opening what is i don't know if it's their pre-show their kickoff show i'm not really sure what they call it but i did watch the two matches that were on there um, and I'm not sure if I caught all of the vignettes and recaps and video packages along the way, but I'm mostly here to talk about the matches because that's what everyone really cares about, right? So there were a couple surprises on this show. Um, and then, so let's talk about the Hard to Kill pre-show first. The first match on the pre-show, I wasn't even aware there were two matches. Uh, the first one was Jake Something versus Madman Fulton. So this was basically a pretty decent big man match, to be honest. Both of these guys move around pretty well for their size. Madman Fulton has improved a lot. I, my son was watching this with me. Most of the paper, he didn't see quite all of it, but he watched a good chunk of it. And I was telling him that Fulton has improved a ton since arriving in Impact. I didn't think he was very good at all when he first got here, but now he is a pretty good big man. Um, and Jake something as well. He was looking at even in better shape than usual here. So this was a pretty good big man match. It only went about five and a half minutes, and Jake ended up picking up the win here with the black hole slam. I was happy to see Jake something win. I think he is a talent that they should be doing a little bit more with. I kind of like the idea because he's not from WWE or anywhere else. He's kind of one of their own guys, and he's talented, and he's got a great look, and he's better on the mic than I thought he was. But he just kind of gets lost in the shuffle at times. So I'm glad to see that uh, he won this match here. And it was a pretty good match. I thought for a, you know, a very quick opening of a pre-show, you got some good power moves. You got uh, a decent little match from these two. So not a bad start to the show. The next match we get, which I, I mean, this is going to be my first complaint about this show, is I don't know why this was on the pre-show. Um, this was the four-way match for, I think it's for the number one contender for the X Division. So it is Chris Bay, Ace Austin, Laredo Kid, and the debuting speedball Mike Bailey, who I have seen as a Canadian. I've seen him on independent shows before. He is fantastic. And his basic story is that he is a martial arts expert and has been a professional wrestler for over a decade now. I think they said 16 years, maybe. Anyways, 
he has been having issues getting over the border, right? For various reasons, I'm sure pandemic, there may have been paperwork issues before that, I'm not sure. But they're basically telling us the story that he's been uh, trying to get down to the States to wrestle and he finally did and he's an impact wrestling. So I'm pretty familiar with uh, Mike Bailey. I'm not sure how much of the crowd was here, but I'm pretty sure he ended up probably impressing them because this uh, four-way match was really fun. Um, everybody, I thought, got their chance to shine at one point or another in this match. Um, I remember Chris Bay hitting a bunch of cutters to people that looked really cool. There was a crazy um, Spanish fly that Laredo Kid just kind of springboard sp Spanish fly to the floor, um, which was pretty crazy as well. And then you sort of ended this one. I was um, speedball Mike Bailey. He looked awesome in this. Just obviously he's really fast and his kicks and things. So he got one really awesome segment here toward the end of this. Um, basically, he hit like a standing moonsault knee drop, I think it was, which was crazy. Then he did this like roundhouse kick where he had him set up in the corner and he like spun a couple times on his way and then just landed a devastating looking kick to the head. Uh, and then he did his, it's like a shooting star press to Chris Bay, who was kind of on his hands and knees, a shooting star press where your knees end up on the back, um, smashing him sort of into the, the mat along the way. Actually, it was Ace Austin, I think, not Chris Bay, and ended up picking up the pinfall there. So Speedball Mike Bailey wins in his debut match in what I thought was a pretty hot four-way match. It went just over eight minutes. Um, my son, who watched the majority of this show, said this was probably his favorite match on the show. So I, in hindsight, I can think of a couple matches I definitely would have preferred Um go on the pre-show with this one move. I think this would have been the ideal hot opener, in my opinion. All four of these guys are incredible. They were given just enough time to make this really fun. Everybody got a chance to look good. So I don't know why it was on the pre-show, but I thought it was a, a very fun match and something that I would actually recommend people check out. Even though it's just on the pre-show, it was, it was a good match. Then we move on to the actual pay-per-view itself. And the opening match is the first ever ultimate x match featuring the knockouts and it is for a future shot at the knockouts championship so this is chelsea green take versus jordan grace lady frost rosemary alicia edwards apparently was a late replacement for rachel ellering which for me that is a significant downgrade i think rachel ellering is quite good and i've really enjoyed some matches and for me alicia edwards she is the worst wrestler on any show I watch that gets the most amount of time, if that makes any sense. I don't think she's very good in the ring. I haven't seen her get better in forever, and she's on TV all of the time, so I guess good for her. But anyway, she's in the match, uh, and finally, sorry, Tasha Steeles as well. So this is an Ultimate X match. That just basically means there's four kind of uh, towers in each corner, and then there are ropes making a giant x above the ring i think they try and say 18 feet or something like that above the ring i don't think it's that high but i think that's what i heard one of them say at some point so anyways there's an x hanging from that in the middle of those two cables where they cross and whoever manages to climb up and retrieve the x will earn a future knockouts championship match so i guess the best thing i can say here is that there was a lot of effort put in by all six of these women but that's generally a polite way of saying that it wasn't that good, and I don't really think it was. Um, this was the match to summarize, I guess, was people fall onto groups of other people repeatedly. So you had people falling off of the X a couple times. One impressive spot where Jordan Grace was hanging from the cable, and I think it was Lady Frost jumped up and was hanging from Jordan Grace, who was able to hold her there. But you had um, Chelsea Green uh, fall from one point from the cable and land a little bit on Ch Tasha Steeles in a bit of a scary spot, but it seemed like Tasha was obviously fine as she was able to continue no problem. There was one spot where I think it was Chelsea Green and Lady Frost had both climbed a couple of the scaffolding in each corner and just kind of jumped is a strong word, kind of fell onto people underneath. They even included um, having havoc around ringside and... and um, Savannah Evans as well, just to act as a base for these women as they were just continuously kind of falling off of things. So you could tell that nobody in this match has a lot of experience in this type of match, and how could they? It's the first ever one. So I thought a lot of things looked pretty bad. There wasn't a ton of wrestling going on. It was all just 
climbing things and then falling down for the most part. Uh, so I didn't really enjoy the match myself. The crowd maybe got into it a bit more. There was also use of kendo sticks and things by um, Alicia in this, which at the time wasn't a problem, but it becomes a problem as you see sort of the last half of this pay-per-view, especially how many weapons and how much hardcore stuff goes on, that it was a little bit early for me to have this brought out in hindsight. But again, she's kind of limited, so she relies on that kendo stick, I think, quite a bit. Um, so basically, the finish for this came as Tasha Steeles and Chelsea Green are both kind of up on the cable, grabbing for the X, and simply Steeles just falls. The commentary tell us that you have to fall to the get it to the mat you can't just be holding it up there so they both kind of have their hands on it but Tasha Steeles ends up falling to the mat with the X so she wins the match in it I mean the saving grace I guess is they did not make this very long this was about a nine minute match so Tasha Steeles gets the X gets a future knockouts championship match so yeah I, I was not impressed by this I don't think this was a hot opener by any stretch of the imagination and again, everybody involved tried. They were all willing to do anything, basically. It just didn't really work for me. It looked like it was just a lot of wait for a group of people to form so that you can fall on them. And just a lot of basic stuff, not a ton of wrestling. So not exactly what I want to see in a hot opener of a pay-per-view. But it leads to something a little bit new, which is Tasha Steeles having a shot at the Knockouts title in the future, I guess. So the second match is Trey Miguel taking on Macklin, who I noticed is now they're mixing in, referring to him as Steve Macklin, which I don't remember them using the first name before. Um, but I, I, it's quite possible that I just missed it as well. But I've always known him to be Macklin since his time in Impact Wrestling. But here he was Steve Macklin. One thing I should point out that I think was actually a nice addition to this show was uh, Tom Phillips with uh, Tom Hannafan, Hannafin. I think he pronounces it. He did commentary for this show, and I thought he was quite good and considerably better than Matt Stryker. I don't mind Stryker some of the time, but he gets a little bit too much for me, a little too dramatic, a little too much into his vocabulary, which he's got a great vocabulary. Don't get me wrong. I just don't feel like he uses it at the right times. So I thought that uh, Hannafin did a really good job, and I wouldn't mind seeing him stick around with Impact Wrestling if that's a possibility, but I'm not sure. But anyways, this was uh, the X Division Championship match. So there's a bit of a stipulation here. If Macklin cannot beat Trey Miguel here, he will not get another shot at the X Division Championship as long as Trey Miguel holds it, along with the storyline that Steve Macklin has not been pinned since his arrival in Impact Wrestling. I've really become a fan of Macklin, and I'm kind of surprised to say that because I wasn't impressed with him in WWE. I really didn't expect much uh, from him when he arrived in Impact Wrestling, but he's been presented really well as just an intense, violent, aggressive ass kicker, basically. Um, and to contrast that, I'm not a big fan of Trey Miguel. Athletically, very impressive. Incredible quickness, can do a lot of cool things, but my criticism, if you listen to my podcast, you know, is that a lot of his stuff just doesn't look very impactful for me. It's a lot of show and flash and not so much impact and delivery on it so I was honestly hoping um, no surprise that Macklin would pick up the win here and we'd get a new X Division champion but alas that was not meant to be uh, the st story of this match was basically that Macklin was targeting Trey Miguel's back and I was impressed with Macklin again just the varied offense he was using and just keeping that focus on Trey Miguel's back uh, Macklin got a lot of the offense in this match. He controlled much of the middle seg section of this match with a lot of cool, like, high-impact stuff, again, targeting the um, back, the lower back, specifically, I guess, of Trey Miguel. One minor change he made was when he did his... Oh, my goodness, what's it called? The crosshair, the move I really love where he has his opponent hanging upside down in the corner and hits a running spear to them. He did that... To Trey while Trey was sort of hanging over the middle of the ropes and not the corner so it looked even more dangerous as though they could easily fly through onto the floor it looked pretty good uh, so then of course Trey gets his odd spots to fire up and just hit his flurry of really fast impressive offense um, unfortunately the result wasn't what I wanted Macklin ended up losing but I guess they tried to protect him a little bit because it took two Trey Miguel finishers the Meteora, which I do not think is an appropriate finisher. It does not look impactful at all. 
but anyways, that's kind of par for the course with Trey Miguel, I find. So Macklin kicked out of the first one, but did not have enough to kick out of the second one. And Trey Miguel successfully defends the X Division title in a just under 13 minute match, which I actually thought was a really strong match. And uh, I continue to be impressed with Macklin. This match got a decent amount of time, and I was interested the whole time. Again, just the I like the little story of targeting the back and really sticking with that throughout. He has really reinvented himself in Impact, and it's really refreshing to see because he didn't really build a name for himself in WWE. He wasn't somebody that they were like, oh, yeah, we have to get him because of name recognition. They got him probably just because... Um, he was available. They wanted him there. I believe his significant other is there. I forget who it is offhand at this point. But um, so he's looked amazing. I thought he looked really good in this match. Again, I was hoping he would win. So just means he cannot have another uh, shot at Trey Miguel as long as he's holding the title. And Macklin gets pinned for the first time since being an impact. But a really good uh, match that I quite enjoyed. So this show is starting off really well. I like the pre-show. Three of the four first matches. Right, I didn't love the women's X Division, or sorry, Ultimate X match, but the other three so far, I've quite enjoyed, so the show's off to a good start. We then move into a match for the Ring of Honor World Championship, actually, which is going to have Jonathan Gresham visiting Impact here and taking on Chris Sabin. And Ian Riccoboni, who I really like on commentary for Ring of Honor, he comes down to call this match, as well as Bobby Cruz, their ring announcer, did the uh, ring introductions for this one. And the Code of Honor was followed. This was actually being held under um, pure rules, which means three rope breaks for each competitor, one closed fish pu fist punch for each competitor, et cetera, et cetera, and handshaking and things. So, I mean, this was an excellent match. These are two supremely talented guys. Jonathan Gresham, I don't love all of his matches because his style is not for me necessarily. If he gets involved in a match that is really ground heavy and grappling heavy, um, I start to lose interest most of the time, but that's not to say that he's not phenomenal. He is amazing at that style. It's just not my preferred style, but I can recognize that he is incredible. Uh, so this match was, I thought, really good. A good back and forth with lots of innovative things. There was a really cool DDT at one point where Saban had Gresham up on his shoulders and then sort of spun him into a DDT that looked really cool. You got the octopus hold was applied, obviously, at some point. he There was a cradle shock, um, but he almost got the pinfall there. Actually, he did get the pinfall, but the referee noticed that Gresham's foot was under the rope. So he did, in fact, call the like count the three count and then noticed. So he sort of had to pull back from that three count um, and called it Gresham's second rope break instead of a pinfall. So then the finish came shortly after that. Um, they basically, Saban caught Gresham with a high knee. There was some back and forth pin attempts on the mat. And then Gresham, it was a really cool looking, really quick counter into like a roll up with a really tight bridge as well to score the pinfall here and retain his title uh, against Chris Saban. It was about just under a 13 minute match as well. And a really good match, just two excellent professional wrestlers given you know 13 minutes of time on a show to kind of have a back and forth match with just you got the holds and counters but then you got some more high impact things as well springboard moonsaults um and things like that and just i thought and the the pure rules didn't really make much difference to me i'm pretty used to them being a person who was watching and reviewing ring of honor anyways i don't think it added a ton here maybe a little bit other than obviously that false finish with the three count with the foot under the ropes but other than that um, but it's still a very entertaining match, and I hope that people, you know, that hadn't seen Jonathan Gresham, maybe he gets a little bit more of a new audience from coming on here. I'm not sure if he'll pick up some people that hadn't seen him before, but he looked really good. Saban looked really good. This is, I, I would say this was pretty much exactly what I expected. There wasn't much chance that this wasn't going to be a good match between these two, and I thought that it definitely was. We then come to another match that I was quite interested in on this card, and that is Josh Alexander taking on Jonah. So a little bit curious about this one because this is, I was really not sure who was going to win this match because Josh Alexander up until recently had been booked like an absolute beast, right? Beat Kenny Omega to win the title, had the title for merely seconds before Moose cashed in his opportunity and took it from Alexander. And then I was afraid because they kind of dropped that story. 
they built Josh Alexander. They really delved into like his family life and built some personality and character for him and did what I thought was an amazing job and then seemingly just walked away from it. Um, so I was hoping that they're going to get back to it. And it was a little bit heartening to see that they did sort of summarize that action before this match to let it know that, yes, Josh Alexander did have the championship. He was kind of screwed out of the championship. He literally was pinned while his family were still in the ring celebrating with him. So I like that they drew attention to that because it lets me know that Impact hasn't forgotten about that, which I thought was pretty amazing storytelling that they seemingly abandoned, but apparently it looks like they may go back to it. So I really didn't know who was going to win this match, but this was a absolute slugfest. Um, the beginning was obviously Jonah just absorbing a lot of punishment from Alexander and it not taking a huge effect because of Jonah's sheer size, but there was just... I don't know, this match was excellent. They got a ton of time. They went just over 17 minutes. There was one spot where Alexander um, jumped from the top rope over the barricade into the first row where Jonah was. Um, and the basic story of this was that Jonah was targeting Josh Alexander's midsection and Josh Alexander was targeting um, Jonah's ankle from early on and both of these guys are good enough wrestlers to make that believable and have lots of different ways to sort of attack those body parts so again I enjoy that story being told and this was just a hard-hitting affair honestly I think looking back this is probably my match of the night so I would highly recommend this one um, it ended up with Alexander applying the ankle lock and sort of winning the match from there um, he did get it. He suplexed and hit a power bomb to Jonah, which was pretty impressive just before this. But eventually, um, he just applied the ankle lock after sort of attacking Jonah's ankle for much of the match. So that story made sense. It also makes sense because it is one of Josh um, Alexander's signature moves, the ankle lock. So Jonah um, fought for a little bit, teased tapping for a little bit, and then eventually did tap out in just over 17 minutes. And I thought this was a pretty excellent match. Josh Alexander is one of my favorites, and I think for people that don't watch Impact or don't know him, um, he should be a pleasant surprise for people. He's, I think, highly underrated, um, especially now that I know he can cut a solid promo and do some nice character work, which came out of that sort of feud with Kenny Omega. So I thought this was an excellent match. I was really happy to see Alexander win. I'm hoping they can go back to putting him in the main event story going forward here. The feeling to me is, I don't know this for sure, but I feel like Jonah may not be here for a long time, and that's why having him take the loss here makes sense to me if he's not sticking around. Because to me, Alexander should be the face of this company within the next six months or so, probably. Uh, I assume he's going to ascend to the title and have a bit of a run with it, I hope. He's definitely deserving. But anyways, I thought this was an excellent match. I would recommend people watch this match. I think it was probably my match of the night, which is not a great sign for where this show goes from here. But anyways, we can still talk about it. And that's where this show kind of goes off a cliff for me because the next match is a hardcore war, which is essentially a war games match without a cage. So it's Gallows, Anderson, Eric Young, Joe Doring, and Diener, which are violent by design taking on Rich Swan, Willie Mack, Heath, Rhino, Eddie Edwards. So this is a hardcore war, right? Um, and this is like, hey, let's get a bunch of people on the card. This is a whole bunch of people that I really don't care about in this company. Gallows and Anderson, um, if you listen to FNS Wrestling at all, you know I can't stand Gallows and Anderson sort of by association. So they never, ever lose. And then you have Violent by Design, who cut good promos and things, but never, ever win. So I don't know if we were, storyline-wise, why Gallows and Anderson would want to partner up with this group, because they don't ever win anything. And then it's just kind of guys who mid-card guys who don't have anything to do being thrown together and putting on a hardcore match, which it was the type of hardcore match I don't really like, where it's, hey, take this thing and hit somebody with it. I've sort of started to reflect and realize that the hardcore matches I like are when people use things not just to hit people with, like if you're doing moves into things or through things or onto things or whatever. Um, I'm much more interested in that than just, hey, we're going to hit each other with a kendo stick and we're going to hit each other with trash can lids and Eddie Edwards is going to set a kendo stick on fire. The fire is going to come nowhere close to hitting gallows and then the fire is going to go out. So that that spot was hilarious. My son was actually watching it with me and he was laughing at that point. So 
I mean, this was a pretty standard hardcore match, and if that's what you like, then that's what you like. Unfortunately, due to the hardcore war format, it becomes incredibly long because um, the first couple people come in for, I think it's three minutes, and then a new entrant every 90 seconds, and the match can't end until everybody's in the ring, and then it's open up for pinfall or submission, right? So... Diener and Swan started out. I don't think there was any talk either because in these types of matches, there is a huge advantage, right, for the team that's always adding a man first because they're going to have an odd number advantage or however you want to say it, a power play because I'm a Canadian person. Um, but I don't remember there being any talk of that being a big deal. So a little bit strange there, but you get all of the standard stuff. Um, one of the big spots, I guess, was Willie Mack going for a moonsault with a trash can and whoever it was moving out of the way. So he basically moonsaulted through a trash can. Anderson brought out a golf club with him. Just my son asked why a golf club. And I said, because Gallows has to be, and Anderson, sorry, have to be just so different, right? Like everyone else would bring a baseball bat. We'll bring a golf club. Isn't that funny? Aren't we funny? Yeah, they're funny. So anyways, um, the golf club ends up hitting Anderson low uh, and then, I don't know, this was just standard stuff, right? Like getting hit with things, trash can lids, tables, whatever. There was lots of stuff coming in here. I just wasn't very interested in this. Um, there was one spot where Swan hit a 450 splash from the apron onto the floor onto Eric Young, but we didn't see it other than him leaping off of the apron because the camera was on the other side of the ring. There's a few times on this show where the camera did not really catch what was going on. Eventually, there's like a door gets involved and somebody goes through it. There's a board with barbed wire on it. And that was Doring and Rich Swan that ended up going through that, I think, is what it was. Um, but anyways, this the finish mercifully came for this finally after over 23 minutes when Rhino Gord Anderson, uh, Carl Anderson, and Heath ended up covering him for the win. So the baby face team win, I guess the idea is that Rhino gets to hopefully end his feud with Violent by Design, which was um, a very lackluster feud. He joined them, basically did one thing, and then got kicked out, and it's been ongoing since then. So the story behind this match, the people involved in this match, and the match itself were all just not really interesting to me. So this was... I, Maybe the people in attendance enjoyed it, I guess, because um, there was lots of hardcore stuff. But I found this match really boring and far too long at over 23 minutes. So this is where the show starts to slide for me. And will the slide continue or will they rebound? I guess we'll find out next. Actually, before we move on to the next part, I almost forgot here. This is how much it resonated with me, I guess, was the big surprise, the big shock, is that essentially we're going to have Ring of Honor, it looks like, invade. But no, no, not their champion, not Jonathan Gresham, who is on the show already. It's Matt Taven and Mike Bennett. So they come out after this match and attack Heath and Rhino. Um, so Swan gets involved and then Vincent from ROH comes out as well. And then PCO comes out as well. And then finally, uh, Maria comes out and this group from ROH stand tall inside the ring. So it looks like there's some sort of takeover angle happening which is fine, and I don't mind. I know it's been done a million times, but if it's done well, it can still be entertaining. My issue is they seem to have picked almost exclusively wrestlers from Ring of Honor that I'm not interested in seeing. I have a lengthy history of not really caring for Taven or Bennett. I don't know why Taven and Bennett are suddenly paired up with Vincent, who they've had a bitter feud with forever, but I guess we're just supposed to forget about that. PCO is well past his prime and does nothing for me anymore. Um, so I don't, Vincent is fine on the mic, but in the ring, he's okay too, I guess. And Maria, I have a feeling will be like the leader slash mouthpiece of this group, but we'll see. I mean, I'm willing to give it a chance for sure. Just this collection of talent from Ring of Honor aren't super interesting to me. If it had been something like Shane Taylor promotions, plus a couple people, that would be really interesting to me. But these guys are just guys I've seen enough of, frankly. But again, I'll give the, I'm, it, to be honest, it may be successful because I may tune into Impact this week to see where they're going with it. And I haven't watched it in several weeks now. I was watching it and doing reviews of it, but I just found better ways to spend my time kind of thing. But I might go back and check it out because of this angle. And I guess that means it is a success. And anyways, going into the next match, um, this is surprisingly for me initially was that it was not the main event. 
and that is the triple threat match for the Impact World Championship, which is Moose defending against W. Morrissey and Matt Cardona. So this match, um, I don't know, they, they sort of ended up using weapons and things in this, so it's almost like the hardcore stuff kind of continued a little bit here. Um, there were some good parts to this. I, I'm not a huge fan of Cardona. I just feel like I'm not getting anything new out of him, and I know he's done some amazing new gimmicks and angles in GCW and on the indies, but that's not how he's being presented in Impact. He's basically still Zack Ryder here in Impact. Uh, Morrissey, I've really enjoyed his character, but in the ring, he is not amazing. Moose, I think, is really good. Um, but again, I I didn't see there was any universe where he wasn't retaining here, that this felt like they were just trying to put these guys and give them a shot. So, I don't know. This match got 16 minutes, and it felt a little bit long to me. I don't think it was bad, uh, but I don't think it was very good. And we had referee bumps so multiple referees coming in and stuff like that. So Morrissey should have won, I think it was. Basically, the crowd counted to eight, and nobody was there to count the pin. So there was a bit of that. Just a lot of booking in this, I thought. Maybe too much booking. Um, and then Chelsea Green gets involved as well. She ends up coming off the stage onto Moose, I think it was, to stop him at one point. Um, and Moose ends up grabbing her by the throat near the end of this. Uh then there's more chairs involved. The second referee counts the near fall for Cardona. Moose ends up powerbombing Cardona into the second referee and Chelsea Green in the corner. And then he spears Cardona. The original referee, of course, is back just in time to make the three count. And Moose retains his championship in 16 minutes here. Um, I don't think this match was bad, but I wouldn't really say it was good either. It was just... They couldn't have kept it simple and just had these guys wrestle. They had to involve referee bumps and Chelsea Green getting involved multiple times and some chair shots and just all kinds of things. Moose, um, again, they almost missed it. He got shoved off the top and hit through a table that was pretty far away from the ring. It looked crazy because you couldn't see him land. They had to go back to a replay to show that. So another spot where the camera kind of missed what was going on. So there were some cool things in this, but again, it was just, they felt like they just did too much in this match. I think there was just too much excess stuff outside of the wrestling. And maybe that's because these aren't some of the strongest wrestlers in the company, I guess. But I, I really think they could have just shortened this up a little bit, gotten rid of some of the excess stuff going on and had a little bit better match. So while I don't think it was a terrible match, I don't think it was great either in terms of a world championship match for your company. Perhaps that's why they didn't put it as the main event. But now we will move on to talk about the main event of this show. And that main event is Deanna Perrazzo taking on Mickey James as Mickey defends the Knockouts Championship here. In their infinite wisdom, they made this a Texas death match. So my one complaint comes right off the bat, where we had a formal hardcore match followed by a match that ended up sort of devolving into a hardcore match in certain spots with tables and chairs and things, going right into another one for the main event. So hardcore stuff, weapon use is not my favorite at all in professional wrestling, especially between these two women who are excellent professional wrestlers. Like Diana Perrazzo is one of my favorite wrestlers of any gender. Um, that of any program that I watch. She is fantastic. She's a technical wizard. I do not know why they made the choice to do this. I guess they're trying to say that this feud is just built to the point where this is how they have to settle it. So my first complaint is I would have much, much, much preferred, even before I saw how this match went, I would have much, much preferred these two women just be in a straight-up match or two of three falls or something that could really let them shine um, in their technical wrestling ability, which they're both excellent. So I was confused by that choice. Then they went with, I don't know if they explained these rules. I probably missed it. But for this, it's basically like a last last woman standing match, except you have to, I sound dumb even saying it, you have to pin them first. And then you can, the ref will start counting the 10. Or you have to have them in a submission and they tap out, and then the referee will start counting to 10. And if they get to their feet, the match continues. So I didn't catch this. So right there was like a pinfall right away, um, and I did not understand what was going on. My son was watching this too. 
um, and he must have missed it because he didn't know. So I think it was Mickey James got a pinfall right away, and we're like, what is going on? And then Perazzo hooked on the Venus de Milo kind of early on, and Mickey tapped out. So this brought up a few points. One, why would you ever do anything other than immediately tap out of any submission hold you put on me? The second I think I'm in a submission, I'm going to tap out, you have to release, and now I have nine seconds to get up. So that is a problem. Um, however, I will say on the flip side, one thing I think it does help because one of the things I hate about last man standing matches is anytime anyone's down, the referee has to start counting, right? And I find that that gets really annoying after a while. So this, in this way, I guess the good thing is the ref can't just start counting until there's been a pinfall. So you pin the person and falls count anywhere. So you can pin them anywhere. Then the referee starts counting. So it does cut down on that but I was confused as hell for the first few minutes of this match because I did not know what was going on. We also see that Ring of Honor women's champion, Roxy, she wasn't part of the invasion, but she's there at ringside with her championship belt. Um, I'm a pretty big fan of her. She is considered a prodigy at this point. I guess she's about 20 years old maybe now, already a champion, already had tons of matches and is, and is pretty polished in the ring. But anyways, there's... Um, there's a woman on either side. Mickey James is throwing chairs from one side into the ring. Perazzo's throwing chairs from the other. The referee's sort of um, jumping out of the way of them. There was some missed spots in this. There was one where I think Deanna was pulling a table from under the ring. And I think the plan was that Mickey was going to do like a wrecking ball drop kick, But she couldn't get far enough to actually touch Perazzo. And then she tried to like audible by just kicking Perazzo, I think, and missed that. And then later on, there was um, near the end, I think it was, Perrazzo was trying to do a gotch pile driver from the second rope backwards through a table, which is ambitious. But Mickey James did not touch the table, and um, Perrazzo just ended driving herself through the table. So this was just what I can't stand about these types of matches. It's a lot of walking around um, and then just basic weapon stuff for a lot of it. You basically took two women who are amazing wrestlers and took the wrestling out of the match, which again, I just don't understand it. So I thought this match was a bit of a mess, if I'm being honest, and I'm shocked to say that about a Deanna Perrazzo match because she is amazing. Um, obviously, Matthew Raywalt got involved at one point. He got hit in the head with a guitar. I laughed. The hardest I laughed on the show was when the guitar was introduced. D'Lo Brown said... Mickey James was up all night making that guitar. And first of all, I'm pretty sure he just meant decorating it because it had hardcore country on it and some like sequins or something. But the idea that she was up all night the night before a championship hardcore match, like making this guitar or even decorating the guitar was just hilarious to me. But anyways, so that guitar ends up getting hit on Ray Walt's head and the guitar did not break. So I don't know. It looked like it was probably um pretty painful then there's uh chair shots obviously um i don't know man this match just did not interest me it was kind of hard for me to pay attention but i did so the finish comes after ray Walt gets hit with the guitar mickey james avoids a chair shot from perrazzo dd teaser and there were tax involved as well which i think mickey james ended up taking the brunt of the the tax so yeah perrazzo gets the ddt and sort of pins her or pins Perrazzo. So now the count starts, right? And so the count is getting close and then Mickey James grabs a chair and a table, piles it on top of Perrazzo and Mickey James does end up winning this match, which is unfortunate. I was kind of hoping that Perrazzo would get her title back. So this match again, far too long. It went almost 20 minutes, just dragged and I don't I don't understand the decision they made to have it be this type of match. Again, the women tried really hard, but there was just, it was just boring. There was so much downtime where they're walking up the ramp just so that Perrazzo can hit a suplex on the on the stage sort of thing. Um, just these two could have had a heck of a technical match with no lulls, right? And just action, action, action. But instead they went with this, um, a very disappointing main event for me. A disappointing second half of this show overall, I would have to say. Um, so yeah, this was not a good match, and I guess Mickey James is off to the Royal Rumble with the Knockouts title. I don't know what's next for Perrazzo, but this match was very disappointing for me. So getting into some overall thoughts, and then probably assigning a letter grade to this. Um, it's funny because this is the opposite of how a pay-per-view should go. The two title matches 
and I would say the hardcore match before them, brought this show down a notch, or maybe even more than that for me, because I was enjoying the first, whatever it was, bunch of matches. Outside of the Ultimate X Knockouts match, I kind of enjoyed the other ones. So, I don't know, like you, um, even Madman Fulton Jake something on the undercard on the pre-show was was good enough right a decent five minute match then you had the four-way for the x division number one contender with speedball bailey debuting excellent match really fun enjoyed it a lot um the ultimate x match was sloppy everybody looked inexperienced in that format which they definitely were i didn't really enjoy it at all then the show picked up and miguel macklin was really good um gresham sabin was really good Alexander Jonah was excellent and my match of the night. I really recommend that much match, sorry. And then it just went off a cliff for the final three matches, right? You got the hardcore war, which was just boring and far too long and just basic and just involving guys that I don't really care about. And the storyline wasn't interesting heading into it. So it kind of failed for me on all fronts. Then you had the triple threat for the championship and it was okay it was better than the hardcore match and it was probably better than the main event but I still wouldn't say it was a very good match it was passable at least right I can say that much for it and then the main event I just finished talking about was really disappointing and for me it was boring there was not enough going on there was too much downtime this isn't the style I want to see these two women wrestle they're capable of so much more than this just a poor choice from the outset to put them in this style of match I think Um, and they certainly did not deliver an entertaining main event. So honestly, this show was a tale of two halves, right? So I think overall I'm going to settle on, because the final three matches were supposed to be the big ones, and they were not good, so that has to hurt this show. I'm going to give it a C+, right? Basically saying there was some watchable stuff on here. It was about an average to slightly better than average, maybe. Um, And again, I would say watch the pre-show, watch the first half, and then you can be done. You don't need to watch the final three matches, in my opinion. Uh, I've told you they're not, unless you are a hardcore wrestling fan and like a basic, you know, like WCW 90s hardcore wrestling fan where they're just getting out stuff and doing things that anybody could do, like hitting each other with things. For the most part, I shouldn't sell them short. There were some, some tough spots people tried here, but a lot of just basic hardcore stuff on the second half of the show that really didn't interest me. So I'm going to give it a C plus for Impact Wrestling's Hard to Kill 2022. A little bit disappointed because I was kind of looking forward to this show. I thought the card looked pretty good, but a few things did not come through. But anyways, that's going to bring me to the end of this solo mission. Thanks to anyone who takes any time out of their week to listen to me or me and my son talk about wrestling. I really do appreciate it. Love to hear from any of you. What did you think about this pay-per-view? What do you think about this podcast? What do you think about my solo missions? What do you think about this microphone I'm trying out for the first time? All of these questions are posed to you. Feel free to answer any or all of them. I'd love to hear from you and I'll get back to you. But I think I'm going to wrap it up. Probably that'll be it for me this week. There's talk of doing our worst of at some point. Worst of 2021 is still on the books and supposed to come out at some point. Barring that, we will definitely be back here on Saturday for episode 78 of the main show to look at some AEW Dynamite and NXT and probably some other stuff as well. So hopefully I will see you all back then. And until then, take care.